Good morning. I'm following in Dr. Trowbridge's traditions that start at 801, so here we go. This is our fifth Department of Medicine Education Day. Welcome. And that's why I'm here to introduce Grand Rounds today. I'm Laura Zakowski, Associate Vice Chair for Education in our department. The day, Education Day, begins with Grand Rounds, where we'll hear the results of projects funded by the DOM Education Innovation Grants. These are peer-reviewed grants and awarded by our Education Committee. Following Grand Rounds, we have scheduled workshops and lunch in the MFCB, which is the Medical Foundation Centennial Building. We have printed copies of the schedule of events in the back of the room, and at the very end of Grand Rounds, there'll be a slide I'll project that'll show what's happening and where afterwards. Please join us if you have the opportunity. We have lunch. You can come and enjoy lunch and hear from Dr. Sarah Johnson, and we also have a few workshops scheduled between Grand Rounds and lunch. So we have three presentations today, one from each of our recipients, and I'll introduce each speaker as First, Dr. Uh, Drs. Katie Fell and Tim Rowe will give the first presentation. They're both graduates of Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine and are current third-year medicine residents. Drs. Fell and Rowe have some common areas of educational excellence that I'll highlight here. They're the co-investigators on the Education Innovation Grant that they'll speak about today. As a result of that grant, they both received the simulation, simulation IST of the Year Award from a UW Health Simulation Center. They're also awarded Education Committee Faculty Development Grants so that they could attend the competitive Harvard Macy Institute program for postgraduate trainees at the Massachusetts General Hospital in December. They further contribute to medical education by leading sessions at the intern prep course for medical students and are participating in the TEACH pathway. This is the Education Academy for Clinical House Staff. There they are continuing to work on their skills as medical educators. It's really clear to me that they both have begun a trajectory towards excellence in medical education. Dr. Zerwin Fell. Thanks, Dr. Skalski, for that really warm introduction. Both of us are really excited to talk to you guys today about our resident-directed curriculum. We have no financial disclosures at this time. Okay, there are about 200,000 board-certified internists in the United States at this time. While no formal comprehensive data has been collected, best estimates suggest that roughly 20% of internists have had formal diagnostic point-of-care ultrasound training, or training in how to use the ultrasound as an aid in the bedside physical exam and aid in clinical decision-making. It's kind of a mouthful, Katie. Can we just call it diagnostic focus from here on out? 100%. We'll just call it focus from now on. At the GME level, most recent survey data suggests that roughly 4 in 10 internal medicine residents have had similar training. And when you look forward to the next generation of physicians, 50% of medical students have already had formal diagnostic POCUS training as part of their medical education, with a particular emphasis on POCUS as an extension of the modern physical exam. That's a lot of current and future learners. And there's not enough teachers right now to meet that demand. So let us ask you a question. If you're an educator trying to develop a curriculum to meet this incredible demand, which pool of potential teachers would you rather draw from? Here's an outline of our discussion today. We'll describe recent developments in diagnostic POCUS for the internists, review our discovery process and grant proposal, highlight some key components of our resident-led curriculum, and most importantly at the end, we'll spend some time predicting future directions and outlining a sustainability plan. Now, diagnostic POCUS has long been utilized by acute care specialties, such as emergency medicine and critical care medicine. As such, dedicated skills acquisition, certification, and even GME accreditation have already been built into their training programs. In contrast to these early adopters, internal medicine has been slower to engage with diagnostic POCUS, with formal training programs only just beginning to appear on the national landscape. And in response to this recent proliferation of interest among internists in diagnostic POCUS, the Society of Hospital Medicine and the Alliance for Academic Internal Medicine have each recently released position papers 
advocating for a burgeoning role of POCUS in the toolbox of the modern internist. Far from reversing, they predict that the trend of interest in internal medicine-focused POCUS is only likely to increase over the years. And at the GME level, residency programs are being urged to incorporate didactics and POCUS in their formal educational framework. To fail to do so, the authors argue, will leave current residents unprepared for the future practice of medicine. And this was actually a study that was just published about two weeks ago. They surveyed internal medicine residents and found that 92% of internal medicine residents felt that diagnostic POCUS was a useful skill for the internists, noting that the biggest barrier to implementation was a lack of expert faculty. This often leaves untrained, unsupervised residents performing studies without any type of clinical oversight. And that's something none of us want, an unsafe situation for our patients. But the fact of the matter is we're not stopping this. In other words, the horse is out of the barn. POCUS is only getting cheaper, more portable, and therefore more accessible to us, residents. And we're not going to stop using it. So how do we make sure that residents are using it safely for our patients? With this in mind, we envision creating a dynamic curriculum that would be led by us, resident educators for resident learners. And we design this curriculum at the level of a categorical internal medicine intern. Inspired by our work with the Teach Pathway and Residence's Educator Curriculum, we targeted to make this an interleaved and modular session for a busy intern schedule. And why did we know, well, what was a busy intern schedule, Tim? Well, uh, we were interns while we were doing it. <laughs> Eventually, we foresaw our curriculum becoming longitudinal and, exist and integrating into existing rotations in order to maintain skills acquisition. And really importantly, from its very inception, this curriculum was designed to be sustainable, keeping in mind that Katie and I are only going to be residents for a couple of years. Now, this is a slide that we're going to refer to as we discuss the evolution of our curriculum. This represents the POCUS opportunities available for our internal medicine residents in 2017 at the start of our intern year. The black horizontal line in the center separates out the two main types of POCUS opportunities for our learners the formal didactics above, and then the informal learner-directed didactics below. The orientation of the boxes is additionally important. Vertical boxes represent one-off sessions, while horizontal boxes represent longitudinal opportunities, something done over the span of a few weeks or even a month. And what you might notice is that the POCUS opportunities for our residents reflected POCUS opportunities for internal medicine residents on the national landscape at that time. They were sparse and heavily procedurally oriented. Our residents had the opportunity to participate in central line training at the start of their intern year, which is designated by the yellow box on the far left-hand side of the screen, where they were taught how to place a central line under ultrasound guidance. Upper level health staff had the opportunity to uh, participate in a UW procedure service elective, where they're uh, given the option to learn how to do something like a paracentesis or a thoracentesis under ultrasound guidance. Really, the only diagnostic POCUS opportunity our residents had was in the TLC. This was heavily learner-directed, and the exposure that you had at that time was really variable depending on the clinical responsibilities of that month, as really any inpatient ward month is. Now remember, this is in stark contrast to the fact that specialties such as emergency medicine already had robust diagnostic POCUS opportunities at that time. Sorry about that, Katie. And so in the uh, winter of our intern year, we performed a needs assessment within the residency, really more to see that, you know, if anybody else had kind of caught that POCUS bug like we had. And we were impressed by the results. Uh, you know, the majority of our co-residents, like us, had never had any formal exposure to diagnostic POCUS. Most of them didn't feel comfortable performing or interpreting results of diagnostic POCUS examinations. But nonetheless, they felt enthusiastic about the prospect of participating in POCUS didactics. And some of us even felt that it could be integrated in formal didactics like morning report or intern lecture series. So maybe kind of like how Dr. Goldberger teaches us about EKG fundamentals in VA report, we could have someone like Dr. Browse teaching us how to characterize pleural effusions. Exactly. And this statistic stopped us in our tracks. At that time, 57% of our co-residents had already experienced a situation where they felt access and understanding to diagnostic POCUS would have changed the way they managed a patient. And keep in mind, this was before most of them had ever put their hands on a probe. Inspired by the results of our needs assessment and with huge support from Dr. Vogelman and our chief residents, we proposed a session-based resident-led curriculum to the curriculum committee in late 2017. 
After receiving the green light from the curriculum committee, we reached out to Dr. Pierre Corey, an expert in diagnostic POCUS and an esteemed medical educator himself. He helped us envision an ambitious yet achievable curriculum for our interns. It was roughly around the same time that Dr. Sam Murray Boehner, one of our rising chief residents, encouraged us to apply for the Department of Medicine Education grant as a method to fund our venture. With the help of innumerable individuals, we were able to put together a successful grant and we were off to work on our curriculum. We spent the remaining spring and summer of our intern year honing our POCUS skills, both informally with Dr. Corey on the wards and formally by participating in his annual critical care POCUS uh, session in the spring of 2018. After his session, we left it feeling inspired to reframe the curriculum for the level of an intern in really a way that only a resident could understand. It's kind of a busy slide, but the following spring as PG2s, we launched our session-based curriculum for the categorical interns. And over the course of a couple months and six sessions, we taught all 31 of them in a short course lasting about four and a half hours over the course of an afternoon. And like Katie said earlier, we designed this course with the busy schedule of an intern in mind. And so we knew that we would have to heavily rely upon a flipped classroom mo sort of model where learners would complete about 75 minutes of pre-session material asynchronously online at their own leisure before they ever set foot inside the sim center. And by doing this cognitive offloading, we were able to, con uh, to sort of guarantee that each learner would have access to about two hours of probe time between standardized patients and the HeartWorks robot model that we see over on the right of the slide here. We blended theoretical and practical experience throughout the course of this session to keep learners engaged. And we capped the afternoon off with integrative cases, which emphasize clinical sort of integration and pathophysiology. Now, we weren't material experts in diagnostic POCUS at the time that we created this curriculum. And so we relied heavily upon Dr. Pierre Corey's expertise, as well as his case library. And we created a pre and post session assessment so that we could study the results of this intervention as well. This assessment was posted on Qualtrics and assessed our learners in three basic domains, ultrasound fundamentals and image acquisition, image interpretation, and clinical integration. We particularly chose these categories as similar categories are used to assess POCUS teaching in the literature. Now, we are still very early in the process of interpreting our data from last year, but we are excited to share with you guys some of the preliminary results. When you look at our interns from last year, there is a, some interesting demographic data that we thought we'd share. Most of our interns were not interested in what we would call, quote, POCUS focused specialties like cardiology, critical care, or hospitalist medicine. Most had had only informal training in POCUS, and very few had ever done any significant number of scans. Nonetheless, they did phenomenally on the assessment. We're really excited to see that they showed a significant improvement after an afternoon in the sim lab. So you can see here on the left of the slide, pre and post session results of individual members who took the assessment, and there's a significant improvement after the session. And really encouragingly, when we split these into the domains that Katie had just mentioned, so fundamentals and image acquisition, image interpretation, and finally clinical integration, you can see that significant improvement holds across all three domains. Why do we care? The literature has already shown that learners, including internal medicine residents, can be taught these skills with high fidelity, and that learners, when taught these skills, can use them to improve their clinical decision making. And it's known that faculty-led curriculum is better than self-directed learning. But what hasn't yet been reported is that teachers like us, residents, are capable of teaching those same skills with a high degree of fidelity. And that's important. The reason it's important is because we've already talked about this bottleneck we're experiencing in diagnostic focus, particularly within the field of internal medicine. And the bottleneck exists because there aren't enough faculty who are capable to teach the incredible amount of learners that exist right now. And it's gonna be several years before those faculty do exist. In the meantime, we feel that it's incumbent upon us, resident educators, autodidacts, near peer teachers, to rise and fill those gaps. So recall, this was the POCUS opportunities for our internal medicine residents in 2017. After our intern session, we added the only formal diagnostic training program for our residents. It was roughly around this time in late 2018, early 2019, that we reached out to Dr. Ann O'Connor in the cardiology department to discuss bringing diagnostic POCUS to the CCU as part of our core cardiology rotation. 
And in the spring of 2019, we were also approached by Dr. Holland here at the VA about the prospect of starting an elective in diagnostic focus and procedures. And of course, we jumped at the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Nick Browse was a uh, logical choice for the course coordinator. He had already helped us to run our intern session. We wouldn't have been able to do it without him. His primary role as the course coordinator here at the VA is to help learners identify patients that would be suitable for diagnostic focus scanning, to give them real-time feedback on their image acquisition skills and image interpretation, and also to guide them through the literature on diagnostic focus, specifically within the field of internal medicine, to help them understand the indications, but maybe even more importantly, the limitations of diagnostic focus. And I'm excited to say that next year I'll be joining Dr. Browse along with Dr. Tom St. Peter in coordinating this course in the future. When we put our grant proposal together, we knew that without easy access to portable ultrasound probes, our learners wouldn't have the opportunity to exercise this new skill that they obtained. We're therefore excited to announce that by the end of this month, two Samsung Lumify probes will be deployed with our UW cross cover and UW admitting resident. Maybe Clint Thayer didn't take that photo. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I think it's a great photo, personally. <laughs> Okay, so let's just take a minute and look forward to the exciting future of point of care ultrasound here in the internal medicine department at UW. <coughs> Katie already mentioned that longitudinal exposure to point of care ultrasound is essential to preventing skills deterioration. And so we've started to look forward to rotations where it might be logical to integrate diagnostic POCUS teaching. And we're starting with rotations where there's already ready access to POCUS probes, as well as faculty who could be there to teach our learners. So the first couple of rotations we're thinking about integration with would be the ED rotation here at the VA, the night float rotation, which we call NOC here, and the community ICU over at Meritor. We've already been approached by a core group of hospitalists at UW who've um, expressed an interest in POCUS and resident education. We identified the UW procedure service as a target for expansion to follow a similar paradigm to what we created here at the VA with the VA POCUS procedure service. And you may be getting this, but Katie and I feel very strongly that residents continue to direct and own this curriculum in the future. And so we're already identifying among the current members of the PGY1 class our successors for when we leave residency. And part of their charge is going to be to improve upon what we've started here, maybe by adding a refresher for upper level residents or potentially adding modules like a focused vascular exam to look for deep venous thrombosis or an abdominal exam in the future. For residents with a particular interest in POCUS, there could be an opportunity for a capstone project in the third year where a resident may have an opportunity to present a case series at VA Morning Report, both increasing the POCUS teaching that's available and encouraging residents to do more near peer teaching. Yeah. And of course, in the future, we as an institution may decide to make some type of formal accreditation process, given that neither ACP nor Society of Hospital Medicine have any formal process at this point in time. And remember that POCUS bug we talked about earlier? Well, I think word of our educational venture has spread, and we've started to have sort of requests from other departments, including the Department of Family Medicine and the UW Physician Assistant Program here in the School of Medicine and Public Health for collaborative ventures in the future, which are in their early stages. So stay tuned on that. And if Tim and I have learned anything over the last three years is that it takes a village for curriculum development. And perhaps the hardest thing about our presentation today was trying to find a way to fit everybody's name on this slide. Yeah, and particularly we'd like to thank members of our UW POCUS vision team, Dr. Pierre Corey, without whom we literally would not have the material or expertise to make this curriculum and who's been supportive from the very beginning. Dr. Nick Browse, who's been our course leader instructor over at the UW Sim Center, as well as now our course coordinator here at the VA. And of course, we would love to give a huge amount of thanks to the UW Sim Center, who continues to encourage us and be a creative outlet for ways that we continue improving our curriculum. Within the Department of Medicine, in a special way, we'd like to thank Dr. Bennett Vogelman, as well as Dr. Betsy Trowbridge for their continued support. And thank you very much to the UW Education Committee for approving our curriculum and giving us the funding and support that we needed to launch it. Each one of our sessions involved an army of volunteers who helped with the scanning portion. And we would like to give a huge amount of thank you to the Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellows and some members of the Emergency Medicine Residency Program who came to help out. And we would be remiss if we didn't thank our guinea pigs, the UW internal medicine residents, many of whom are with us here today, particularly the current PGY1s and PGY2s who have experimented with us. And in a very special way, we'd like to thank Dr. Priya Roy, 
who uh, actually hasn't done our curriculum yet, but uh, very sportingly agreed to be our standardized student. I'm not sure she knew what she was getting into when she did. Thank you, Priya. Yeah, some could argue forced. Here's our work cited. Thanks so much, guys. If there are questions at the end, please come up to talk to Drs. Rowan Fell. Our second speaker is Dr. Madeline Alvarez. She graduated from our medical school where she was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society and also graduated from our medicine residency program. She completed an advanced fellowship in women's health and a master's degree in education leadership and policy analysis. She is the current women's health medical director here at the VA and the director for the Advanced Fellowship of Women's Health National Coordinating Center. In addition to the topic she will discuss today, she has also conducted research in empathy and burnout in medical education and in medical student curriculum. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Thank you, Dr. Sikowski, for that, that welcome. Um, so I'm going to do a couple polls, so if you want to get started in texting that to join, um, and I'll get started. So it's been a long week, at least it has for me, because I've been preparing for this. Um, beep, 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 your alarm goes off, you're struggling to open up your eyes, but you do. You get out of bed and take a quick shower, you look at your phone and realize you are late for Grand Rounds and you need to get to the VA fast. So how do you decide to get to the VA? Do you call an Uber to avoid parking? Do you decide to call in sick and take a mental health day? Do you bike to work? The snow is not stopping you. Got some brave people biking in. <laughs> All right, it sounds like people are calling an Uber. <laughs> so you catch an Uber, off you go to the VA. You walk into the auditorium and you give a sigh of relief. It's medical education day. You're ready to get your learning on. So you grab a donut. You're craving that sugar rush. You start to look around and you try to find that perfect seat. And then you find it. So where do you sit? Are you going to be front and center so you don't want to miss any of the presentation? You want an aisle seat because you, maybe you're going to sneak out early. <laughs> Back, you might fall asleep and you don't want anybody to notice around the side because you really don't want to sit next to people. There, there are people front and center. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll go with the aisle seat. Oh, a couple more people are sitting. So you settle into your seat, and you anxiously await the start of Grand Rounds. I take the stage, and interestingly, you get to pick the topic. So you pick Pulp Fiction, The Making of Orange Juice, Call of Duty Medical Edition, YOLO, Staycation versus Vacation, or Nerd Out, Chess as a Competitive Sport. <laughs> I'm actually really okay if you don't choose Call of Duty. I kind of want to see what happens. All right, we're going to do YOLO. I'm calling it. Sadly, you spend your morning wandering around looking for this top, but you're actually not able to find what you're looking for. But just as you're about to do something productive, you stumble into a different talk. And you're here at Call of Duty Medical Edition. <laughs> so. I just had us play a little bit of a, a choose your own adventure game, and that's gonna be what I'm talking about today, is gaming and medical education. I have nothing to disclose. My learning objectives for the day are to talk about games and how we can use them in education. And I wanna discuss briefly some of the challenges of interprofessional education, and then I'll talk about how we used a game to uh, help teach, a choose your own adventure game to help teach interprofessional practice. So let's start out with by looking at what is a game. 
So a game has a goal. Such as in Monopoly, the game is to basically get all the money and have all the other players go bankrupt. There are rules, and I Wikipedia it, and that's what it is. It's everybody goes bankrupt. <laughs> there are rules, so you roll the dice, you um, take turns, you land on a property, and you are supposed to buy it. That's how Monopoly actually ends, is because you have to buy the property. There are restrictions. You're supposed to go around the board. You can't you know, skip spots or anything. And then finally, your participants have to accept these rules and restrictions. You're suspending reality for a little bit. So when that card tells you to go to jail, you go to jail. You don't pass go, you don't collect $200. So let's look at how games could be well suited for learning. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is incorporate play into learning. Now, James Paul G is a prominent researcher in games and learning theory and notes that there's many elements of games that make them well-suited for learning tools. And I'm going to talk about a few of them. So first of all, motivation. Again, you have a goal that you're trying to reach. And whether it's a competitive goal or collaborative goal, people are trying to reach that goal. And games provide that motivation. Games also invoke emotion frequently by providing a storyline and that a narrative that you can get involved with. They might have characters that you can identify with, uh, and you can really feel those successes and failures. And we know that you know, invoking emotion can really um, help you understand that concept that you're trying to learn. Games also include problem solving. You know, if there weren't any challenges to the game, everybody would just finish right away and there would be no winner. And frequently, games have escalating problems so that as you learn skills and knowledge to solve one problem, you have to apply those new skills and, um, and knowledge to solve harder problems at a later level. Games also provide feedback. So decisions that you make often influence decisions that you are going to make in the future or where your um, character goes. So in case if you're going to explore this hallway looking for treasure, you might actually find a bad guy. And so you get that feedback of what that choice made for you. And finally, games are starting to incorporate collaboration more. Instead of just a competitive um, game, you can work with other characters. And so as you can see in this picture, you know, we have characters with different skill sets, different tools at their disposal, and they have to work together to solve the problem rather than trying to, you know, just compete and have one winner. So if we think about, you know, those are all great in theory, does that actually happen in practice? And we can find that it really does, and I just picked a couple to look at, but for motivation and feedback, um, there was a group that made a virtual reality game set in an emergency room department. And they had uh, medical students um, play the game, looking at different um, patients come in with different disease states. And they compared those to students that just did case studies or just read. And they noted that the students that played the game had higher levels of engagement and also felt that they got better feedback on if they were doing well versus not. So if we think that games are good for, as a, learning, a good learning tool, let's see what we can teach with games. And these are just some examples of things that you know, people have taught using games in medical uh, education. So knowledge, technical skills, clinical skills, especially like algorithms like ACLS protocols, and some of the more traditionally harder to teach skills like empathy and perspective taking and encouraging behavioral change. And I'm going to go through um, more deeply into some of the examples. So again, this is a virtual emergency department uh, game. And I just wanted to show kind of a picture of what this looks like and kind of the high fidelity uh, situation that you're put in. And so for this game, they were looking at knowledge. And they had medical students at you know, different level semesters in their training. Uh, play the game, and they tested their knowledge before and after. The red is the post-test and the blue is the pre-test. And they noted that after playing the game, knowledge increased. And it was most notable in the, the novice groups, the ones that hadn't gone through as much medical training. Surgeons are you know, using gaming to teach technical skills more and more, especially laparoscopic skills training. 
Uh, there's a Nintendo Wii game called Underground that helps teach laparoscopic skills, and there's a special apparatus that they can use. So for this study, they had residents um, either play the Nintendo Wii game for about three hours, and then they had a group of residents who just did laparoscopic skills training in a simulation lab, and then they compared the two. And those that played the game um, had better camera navigation, instrument navigation, and overall coordination compared to those that trained in the simulation lab. And this is just a picture showing you the, the apparatus uh, that they used for the, the game and a picture from the game. So it's you know, a mining game that they're trying to use. It's not you know, attempting to actually do surgical techniques in the game. Now if we think about you know, some of those harder skills like perspective taking, uh, there's a game looking at people in poverty and the challenges that they face. And for this game, you are given $1,000, and you have to figure out how to you know, secure housing for yourself and food for yourself and get a job. And you have to do that on $1,000. And so if, in this study, they had students play the game, and they, did a, uh, they tested their attitudes towards people in poverty beforehand and after. And they noted that after they played the game, there was a much improved attitudes toward people in poverty. And in this graph, they just divided them into quartiles based off the pretest. And the biggest improvement was those in the lowest quartiles. And finally, if we look at you know, behavior changes and competencies, so there was a um, interprofessional uh, course based on uh, disaster management competency. And it was an online course that included games. And there were students from all different professions who uh, went through the course and played the game. And after this, they noted that there was improvement in um, a variety of competencies. The, this basically shows that the, every competency had improvement. Um, but basically, you know, there was improvement in teamwork. There was improvement in communication. They also noted that students had a much better appreciation for that interprofessional teamwork that was needed for these types of skills. So when we thought about our course that we wanted to create in interprofessional education, we thought, you know, gaming has been used for this, and maybe there's something to that that we could contribute in cre creating a game. So briefly, I just want to touch on interprofessional education. Uh, it's becoming more of a focal point of education across the board for medical students, residents, um, everywhere, because we're working in teams on a daily basis, and we need to be a little bit more intentional about how we teach people to work in teams. However, there's a lot of logistical challenges in working in or teaching in teams, you know, and trying to get students from multiple different professions together in time and space to work together, and a need for practice of these skills. So that's why we thought a game might be well suited for us. So I developed along with my team a choose your own adventure game similar to what I led you through in the beginning of this presentation. And I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what that sort of looks like. And this is just one section of our game. But as you can see, you know, you start at the top and then you have choices, and it quickly branches out. So you end up having 10 storylines with 10 different endings that students can, or learners can go through. And you can see how this can quickly escalate if you're not careful. <laughs> so going a little bit more into detail of our actual game, uh, we kind of wanted to apply some of those principles that I talked about earlier. So, for our motivation, we basically have our resident um, working through a clinical scenario. And they, the idea is to treat a patient and have good team dynamics. We also included problem solving. So this is supposed to be a challenging case that you are familiar with. It's a patient with acute on chronic back pain, something that you see frequently but can be challenging to manage. Um, and we wanted to, you know, make it so that the clinical decision making wasn't the focal point of this. We really wanted the, the learner to focus on, 
you know, the teamwork and communication and collaboration. And in this case, it's with non-player characters, but it's a chance to experience what that might look like. And we also tried to get at the emotion of this. So we created a, a, tried to create a realistic narrative to make the learner really feel like they're in this situation. We have the learners choose avatars that follow them through throughout the game, and the avatars have different emotions and stances that you know kind of play out of what is going on in the scene. As you can see, this is another stance. They interact with other characters in the game. The patient has audio, which is also a very an emotionally charged audio at times, um, if you for one way to say it. <laughs> And as far as feedback, well, every decision that they make changes the course of the story. So they are getting feedback by the decision. But then more explicitly, we have you know, these learning points so that the learners can click on them so that they can even more um, have a better uh, example of what we were trying to convey. So getting a chance to learn those teamwork and communication skills. So we've had some residents play this game, and some of the reactions is that it was a very realistic scenario. One resident actually felt a little anxious about having to treat a patient with acute on chronic back pain. Um, they thought it was a fun learning venue, and it was a fun and interesting experience. So when we think about this game, again, this is one part of our larger interprofessional education curriculum. Uh, we wanted to have a game as an asynchronous learning tool that residents could do on their own time uh, and then come back and have a better discussion. It gives them a chance to practice uh, these skills that they will then use you know, in a real life situation. And we are hoping to, or we're planning to use, pilot this curriculum in the VA um, block curriculum and then hopefully we'll get this to all of the internal medicine residents and then maybe eventually um, to other professional students as well. Overall, we found that designing a game is quite complex. Uh, so for Choose Your Own Adventure, every choice had to be realistic and not obviously good or bad, which can be quite difficult to do. Um, again, as you saw, the scope of this and maintaining that within a reasonable level and trying to navigate 10 different storylines at the same time is difficult, uh, and also being very intentional about our learning outcomes for every decision point. Overall, games can be very resource intensive, especially to develop, both in your time and creativity to develop, and then also they can cost a lot of money, especially if you are you know, creating something like a virtual reality game. Um, and that kind of leads into the fidelity of it. So a virtual reality game is gonna be a very high fidelity game. Um, which we didn't do, but we also uh, you know, felt that even with the narrative, we were able to create a very realistic story um, that was an emotionally impactful teamwork environment. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that there's other kind of gaming uh, situations around UW. There's gaming organizations, Gear and Field Day Lab, which are associated. Some educational games that have come out of UW are Fair Play, which Dr. Carnes made. Um, Anatomy Pro M and Virulent are a couple others. And then thank you to my interprofessional team that helped make the game as realistic as possible and helped you know, create everything. And take, thank you to the Medical Education Committee for funding this. Thank you. Our last speaker is Dr. Miguel Leal. It's, uh, he it has given Grand Rounds a few weeks ago, so I believe he holds the record for the closest consecutive Grand Rounds presentations. Congratulations. Today's topic is different. Dr. Leal graduated from medical school in Fortaleza, Brazil, and completed his residency and chief residency at University of Chicago Hospitals. He then completed fellowships in cardiovascular medicine and in clinical cardiac physiology here at UW. He is currently assistant professor and director of both the cardiovascular medicine fellowship and the clinical cardiac electrophysiology fellowship. He has a number of awards for his excellence in clinical care, in teaching, and in research. The most recent ones are the Dr. Benjamin and Marion Schuster Award, 
the UW Health Patient Experience Award, and the Department of Medicine Evans Glass Roth Teaching Award. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Zakosi, for the warm introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here again and um, see many familiar faces as well. So first of all, I would like to congratulate the previous speakers. It's phenomenal to see the type of attention that is devoted to innovation in our department, right? I think we talk about innovation a lot. It's a very easy concept to imagine, but a hard one to grasp and to make into reality. And I think the two previous talks were great examples of that. So I'm very humbled by them. It's hard to follow those. But I'm here to present something that along the lines of medical ed innovation in medical education was brought forth by the Cardiovascular Medicine Fellowship Program here at the University of Wisconsin. And it has to do with empathy training. And the title is, is this a new competency that we should start be paying more attention to these days? And I have no financial uh, disclosures relevant to this topic today. So empathy, again, one of those words that we've all heard multiple times, and by, I'm by no means an expert in the topic. I have people in this auditorium that are much more qualified to talk about empathy than I am. But the experience of this medical innovation grant allowed me to delve a little deeper into the world of empathy, understanding what exactly it means. And authors like Marco Iacobani defined it as the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. So the idea of understanding and sharing the feelings of others, again, it's very easy to read but a little hard to practice and to grasp. Because the first thing we tend to do when we are confronted with somebody else's feelings is to pass judgment. Not necessarily negative judgment, not necessarily critical judgment, but judgment of some sort. It's a human reaction. And empathy asks us to divest ourselves from that innate reaction and try to feel with the person as opposed to feel on behalf or for the person. Uh, Martin Hoffman defined it as processes that make a person have feelings that are congruent with another person's feelings rather than their own. Again, a huge ask. And we as clinicians, as healthcare professionals, we are facing situations that require this skill nearly every day. The word clinician comes from the performing care, delivering care, listening, being empathic or empathetic by definition. So it's interesting how we ask ourselves to be clinical entities, clinical actors, and yet receive very little training in one of the most fundamental skills to become a clinician, which is to develop this sense of empathy and to practice it on a daily basis. Now, this term is old, it's coined over a century ago, and again, it means fill into if you translate it from the German word from which it was derived. Some philosophers that have been clustered as empathist philosophers, they had this impression that feelings were a method of understanding, not necessarily the thing, the item to be understood. So it's an interesting way to look at this. We're not obliged to understand how people are feeling, but rather use those feelings as a way to understand where their person is at and, where he, and what he or she needs. So it's more than just semantics. It's more than just a game of words. That is actually true meaning to using feelings as a tool, not as a goal. And finally, Edith Stein experienced a foreign consciousness in general, divesting yourself again from your own thoughts. Now, it's also easier to say what empathy is not than to say what it is. First of all, empathy is not a feeling. Definitely does not mean something like pity or concern. It's also not the same as sympathy, which is a, for a non-native speaker like myself, it was delightful to learn that because I have to tell you that empathy, if you translate it to my native Portuguese, means what sympathy kind of means in English. So it's an interesting exercise of, again, learning not only a new vocabulary, but understanding the difference in semantics and how sometimes they can be tricky. Sympathy is more like feeling for. And if we were to try and understand this in a cartoon level, if you're sympathetic to somebody, you literally say to them, I'm sorry, that's really too bad. You know what, this toy is broken, but at least you have another two toys to play with. That's pure sympathy, which is almost always well intended, but very poorly executed, if the goal is to really feel for or feel with someone. Empathy is more like, let's try and fix this if at all possible, and if not, I'm going to live this pain and this sorrow of this broken toy with you for the next 20 minutes of silence, awkward as it may be. <laughs> so empathy leads to connection, where sympathy, and I know that doesn't sound very intuitive, but unintentionally, sympathy almost always leads to disconnection because it comes revested with this silver lining statements. Every time you try or I try to start a conversation with at least you are unintentionally being sympathetic to someone's cause, and you are literally disconnecting yourself. You're saying, wow, you're super sad about this, but you know what, at least you have that. Hey, listen, at least you have 
500 patients who survived this procedure. I know this one kind of didn't do so well, but think about it. At least you have a great practice. At least you have a lot of people going for you. This is well intended, isn't it? I mean, we say that to feel good about ourselves, the other person to bring this awkward, sad, difficult moment to a lighter tone. But little do we know, at that very moment, we're being as non-empathetic as possibly we can be. And empathy requires proximity. So people have looked into this, and it's an interesting research field that has been over the last two or three decades, but has become really hot as a topic over the past decade and a half or so. So this is a meta-analysis of seven studies involving over 3,000 patients and over 200 clinicians. And the relationships have been established. Again, we're not talking about cause and effect, but associations between empathy and communication between patients and clinicians, adherence to therapy. I particularly like the last statement, which is enablement. So this could be misconceived as now the provider is getting so approximate, so close to the patient that a sense of codependency that may not be healthy begins to build. And studies have shown that that's actually not what's attained, but patients feel more enabled to overcome their own challenges if they have truly empathic moments of interaction with their clinicians. And these have been looked into different fields. So for example, in acupuncture practice targeting patients with irritable bowel syndrome, it has been demonstrated that if patients receive this so-called augmented clinical visit, which has intentional and purposeful instances of empathic statements and empathic moments, and I'll get to those in more detail in a moment, it appears, based on studies like this one, that these patients felt better. And our own University of Wisconsin has led that field when it comes to understanding how empathy impacts human care. Not just in subjective assessments as if, do you feel better? But in objective measurements such as your immune response during allergic reactions or during the common cold. And it looks like the ability to actually have sustained effects leading to shorter and less severe disease courses only comes if you have the so-called perfect empathic moment. And these can be measured through tools that I'm gonna show in a moment. But if, if a visit has good intent, but it's not designed in a way to offer it, this almost surreal concept of perfect empathy, the effect may just not be tangible enough to be measurable on a p-value scale. Tools have been developed to try and ask physicians and patients, clinicians and patients, how much they connected how much they felt that sense of approximation or proximity, how much did they feel their clinician or their patient for that matter was feeling with them in the moment as opposed to feeling for them on their behalf, how much they were in their shoes as opposed to trying to place themselves in their shoes. So there are ways, and these are obviously imperfect ways, right? These are questionnaires, these are surveys, these are efforts, scientifically evidence-based efforts to gauge this very intangible concept of empathy. What we do know, though, is that intangible as it may be, empathy does decline, and it does decline to a lot of professions, but it's particularly cruel with the medical field. And it begins early on. If you think about it, medical school is relatively short in the big scheme of things. It feels like forever when you're in it, but it's short. It's four years of your life, a year and a half or two of which are mostly lectures like this in an auditorium where you're going through theory of pathology, physiology, pharmacology, immunology. So short as it is, it's a long enough time journey to curtail somebody's empathy skills and to sort of squash them down a little bit. I know this is not the first or second time you're seeing a slide that brings a message like this. And the fact that our department has emphasized this so much in the last few years has made us more familiar with this concept that something has to be done about this because we're taking professionals or future professionals who will become clinicians for a living. A few of them will become basic researchers, but the vast majority will be dealing with people daily, weekly, either in clinical settings, in procedural settings, in surgical settings, or a combination of all of the above. And yet, look what's happening with their empathy skills. So we thought fellowship training, which is the part that I'm more familiar with, comes almost a decade after medical school training. So if those trends continue, what kind of professional are we having here arrive at the fellowship level, PGY 6, 7, 8, 9, and beyond? What kind of professional are we dealing with? What kind of empathic skills or lack thereof he or she will bring with them? And what is our responsibility as a training institution to try and promote 
a little bit of a reversible change, if such change can be made. Because it's all hypothetical. Can we actually revert that? Or has society, have the pressures we're all under imprinted on us this permanent notion that empathy is a great concept, but guess what? It doesn't really belong to doctors and nurses because it's just how busy and stressful our lives are. Well, so we had the idea, let's see if this can be attained. So we submitted a grant. It was proposed to the Department of Medicine in the spring of 2018. And it was fortunately approved in June, which was something we celebrated because it allowed us the financial means and also the, the overall organizational means that we needed to transform this into reality. We fortunately have outstanding local resources, so we did not have to outsource this outside of the UW campus. We went and talked to Toby Campbell and Amy Zelensky. We talk faculty as well as our staff and I like to acknowledge that they are essentially the, the core, the pillar of this entire initiative because we first of all approached them and asked, is this possible? Can we establish a system, a method by which we teach or try to teach empathy skills during fellowship training? And you can imagine how busy fellowship residency and medical school training are. We have been alluded to this all morning long. These are times in your life when there's a lot going on and how can you creatively add things to that busy agenda and yet make it work? So the first step was obviously you gotta train the trainer no one of us had the ability and the skills that we talk faculty possesses when it comes to empathy. Not only the literacy that comes with it, but also the skills necessary to try and facilitate some of that to our learners. So that we had this teach that or train the trainer workshop approximately a year ago at Wimmer. And we had 10 faculty, seven physicians and three nurse practitioners who devoted their time to participate. The beautiful behind, the beautiful thing behind this is this was volunteered. These people did not receive a single penny. In fact, they actually made their lives a bit busier by shoving away those clinical duties they had on that day. With, clearly, these duties did not disappear. They were taken care of on different moments, but they decided that this was a, a, a relevant enough topic that merited their attention. In cardiovascular medicine, we are a division of 60 physicians and 40 advanced practice clinicians. So this is a nice chunk seven physicians and three NPs to represent the whole. And then those groups, or those people, were then the facilitators in coordination with the We Talk faculty during the two sessions that were devoted to the fellows two months later, in April of last year. Those were done at the Pile Center. The methodology applied theater-based uh, scenarios, including trained actors in simulated real-life scenarios. And it targeted all of our 17 fellows at that time. That includes general cardiology or cardiovascular medicine, interventional cardiology, electrophysiology, and heart failure and transplant cardiology. The importance of this is these are fellows with a wide span of experience here. You have from the youngest PGY4 to the most senior PGY8 or 9 in some cases. So these are people who are approximately a decade away from their medical school training years. Our hypothesis was that after participating in those workshops, the fellows in training would report improved abilities to notice empathic opportunities, reflect in the moment of their empathic communication, and respond constructively to improve both the patient and the clinician experience. Notice that these goals are modest. We're not saying we're gonna teach people how to be empathic. I mean, who can possibly say that about himself or herself, no matter how experienced one he, he or she is? So the idea is to just build those initial blocks, those foundation blocks, and hopefully the fellows will take it to the next level as they apply those fundamentals in their daily practice. Uh, there are several ways to try and measure that. The proposed methodology we talked suggested was the care measure, and the questionnaire is disposed here. Essentially, it has six or seven domains. Six are depicted here. I'll mention the seventh in a moment. And we found significant improvement in all these measures, except for the domain of changing your communication plan in real time. And in a graphic form, those were the responses from the participants on a scale from one to five. So the seventh element is you see to the far right of the slide, which is the one that showed the biggest improvement, the importance of peer observation. It is interesting how we as a group were somewhat skeptical that peer observation would make that big of a difference. We assigned it a 2.18 importance scale, but that clearly proved to be something the participants felt it was instrumental, it was fundamental, which is why empathy training should, be, should probably be taught in groups and not just individually. So it's not like an OSCE exercise that we do in medical school, but rather a group activity that can lead to more engagement and several teachable moments that happen when more people are involved. Some of the qualitative responses the fellows spelled out anonymously were that they were more deliberate about silence. Some people like me have a tremendous hard time staying quiet. There's always something to be said. There's always something to be spoken, but 
Empathy requires the ability to listen, right? You can't be filled with someone if you don't have any idea what they're doing, and all you want to do is present the next solution to their problem, which they barely started to describe. And we, as Dr. Seward is urged, always say something, fix something, improve something, and sometimes it's better just to be quiet. Acknowledging that sometimes there is no good answer, again, Control that sentiment that we have to come up with a solution in our assessment and plan, no matter how intangible this disease process is. Sometimes there is no good answer, and sometimes there is no fault in admitting that. Because sometimes that's all the patient wants to listen, because nobody will be that honest and clear to him or her about that. Finally, limit the knowledge over sharing. Another very easy temptation, slippery slope for qualified, competent physicians, is to, in the best of languages, try to share all that he or she has to teach to the patient. And sometimes they're just not in learner mode. They're just not there to learn. They're there to talk and to hopefully be understood in an empathic manner. Now, we did a SWOT analysis after this pilot project. And first of all, these results were promising. They indicated measurable impacts on the development of empathic skills, not on the acquisition, but on the development, foundation blocks, to become an empathic clinician. There was a high percentage of satisfaction reported by the participants. Because again, remember, this is time invested. These are two, three full days in the middle of a busy spring for both fellows in training and also attending physicians and nurse practitioners. Some of them could candidly and anonymously say, this is great, but just too busy or too burdensome. And we did not get that response, which was very pleasing to hear. Now, we also noticed there was insufficient coach training. By no means a session is enough. Two or three are not enough either. So the idea is that this will require additional faculty development. But how do you do that? Right? This is the big challenge. How do you have an initially funded project like this based on a grant, and how do you make it sustainable? So the decision was made to select an even, even smaller group of faculty within that initial volunteer group, and then promote deep investment in that small number of faculty over subsequent several years for small group facilitation, so that we in the cardiovascular medicine division can responsibly with a curriculum and not just in an impromptu way, perform this workshop on a yearly basis, initially under the auspices of WeTalk as our main partners in this initiative, but then at some point promoting it ourselves to our fellows in training and determining, is this something a fellow needs more than once during his or her training? Is having this every year too much? How about in the first and last year so we have an idea of growth? So that are questions that are right now being debated and discussed. The Empathy Training 2.0 happens in about a month, so we already have the date selected. And again, as we said, a small segment of that faculty is identified or has been identified and, and charged with furthering the cause. So once again, thank you. This has been a very educational morning for me as well, based on the previous talks, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. What wonderful presentations we've heard today. Uh, there are a few workshops this at, at the rest of the morning. There is lunch over at the MFCB. There are some handouts in the back showing this information as well. But please come and join us if you have the opportunity to hear both learner mistreatment, building a fellow directed curriculum, teaching well-being, and also hearing about medical education success. Thank you very much for attending today.